Welcome to Ultra Boy Runs, the adventure podcast. The Christmas episode, a review of 2021. It probably comes as no surprise that I'm something of a grump at the festive period. So I thought I would share my festive grumpiness in my end of year running review. Now, in more conventional times, I would have written a long, and some might argue, me included, a boring tale of woe about my year of running. Therefore, I wonder why I have tripled the workload to produce a podcast with much the same outcome. Well, let's delve in and find out. So... Let's get the festive bollocks out of the way. Ho, ho, ho. I mean, that'll do, won't it? I think the first thing is that 2021 has felt like something of a lifetime in of itself. I am sure we all remember that we started the year in lockdown and with limited capacity for movement and interaction. The idea of running a race wasn't on many people's agendas at all, and it all seemed so far away. But the arrival of the vaccine rollout across the UK brought with it an easing of restrictions and the opportunity to get out and about again. I recall that once the Scottish government started to allow us to travel, we had no hesitation in picking a nice hill walking route to test out. We started with Court Malore in the Campsies and soon after, the idea of running races was returning. My first one of the year was the delayed inaugural Ultra Scotland 50, which I think was pretty much the first COVID-secure Scottish race to take place after the lockdown. And it was a hazy mix of trepidation and relief. I hadn't raced since the Ultra North the previous September, but that had been in England. This would be my first Scottish race since the Skull Trail in March 2020. We'd gone down in the motorhome to sleep under the stars of Clattering Shores, a few miles from the start in St John's of Dalry, as most hospitality businesses were still not open, and we didn't feel very confident about staying in a hotel or similar, especially while we had our own facilities to draw upon. I remember lining up amongst the dozens of grateful runners, all wearing masks and all wondering what a COVID-secure event meant. I developed a very swift respect for Wayne Drinkwater and the GB Ultras team, who really went out of their way to make sure that they stayed within the rules, but that the runners could compete. Now, having barely been near a hill in about six months, I really, really felt the race. And the injuries really fucked me over. And my ability to move downhill with any pace at all was gone. And there is no doubt about it that the whole of the lowlands of Scotland will have heard me cursing my old disintegrating body. I was, however, joined in this expedition by a lovely chap called Kieran, who was having more issues than I was. And while I was running, all of the Covid problems seemed just to disappear. It was just a tough day out on those lowland hills, but I found myself holding on and being surprisingly strong at the end. I mean, don't get me wrong, I was 100% ruined, and I hurt like nobody's business. But more importantly, I was back in business. All I needed now was more races to do. The Ultra Scotland 50 had given me back my appetite for racing, so it was with dismay that races were still being cancelled left, right and centre. Races were being moved to the end of the year, and although it would be brilliant, it was going to be jam-packed. By the time May had arrived, I'd already seen the postponement, in some cases for a second time, of the Cheviot Goat, the Bonnie Prince Ultra, the Loch Ness 360, the Pennine Bridleway Challenge, and Run the Blades. You had to have the most tremendous sympathy for the race organisers, who time and again seemed to have the rug pulled from under them, or were hit by forces outside of their control. And this didn't just affect me, but lots of runners and organisers would be feeling some form of pinch caused by the pandemic. Now don't get me wrong, racing isn't that important in the grand scheme of things. But the organisers of these races aren't making millions. And if they can't be supported by runners, or were discovering that the financial issues being caused were too onerous to bother, 
then we might be looking at a post-COVID race calendar that seems a little bare. All we could hope was that the restrictions continued to ease and that racing could continue. I decided that I couldn't wait for ultra running to return properly and decided to take advantage of any and all racing opportunities that cropped up. And for the first time since social media was invented, I found a use for it. Discovering races. An early example of this was discovering the amazing team at Trails of Fife. Now, I have a great deal of affection for Fife. It is a place I enjoy visiting on a semi-regular basis, and any opportunity to race there will be taken. Therefore, when the delayed Frostbite 5 was announced as running at the delightful Lockhaw Meadows Country Park, I decided that we would once more load up the moho and enjoy a weekend away in anything but frostbite conditions. At the time, I commented that it was more like the Sunburn 5 mile race rather than the Frostbite 5, but this event offered me an opportunity to test the injury I had sustained at the Ultra Scotland and also to test just how fast I could push myself after years of lethargy and not doing very much running at all. We had a lovely time at Lockhaw Meadows in the Moho. We went paddleboarding, kayaking and open water swimming. It was a wonderful Saturday. I sort of wondered why I was bothering racing. And then, as I arrived at the outdoor registration desk on the Sunday morning, I remembered. There was such a lovely atmosphere at the start. People glad to be back together. Some of whom had clearly not seen each other for the duration of the lockdown. And then there was me watching it all, soaking it up at one of my favourite places. I wandered down to the start line, which was a few minutes from the registration, and chatted to some of the runners. I'd forgotten what it was like just to speak to another runner and simply chew the fat. When the race came, I found myself hurtling away like someone had put a light under my nutsack, and I stayed that way for the next five miles. I didn't slow to look behind me to see if fellow local runner Fiona was there. I didn't stop to take photographs. I didn't hesitate to push my old dilapidated body to the limit. I thundered around Lockhaw Meadows, and when I picked up a shadow about a mile from the end, I used his influence to force me to go harder, faster, and stronger. I don't recall the last time that I pushed to the point of my lungs busting, but this was it. Everything about this was just awesome. I loved being in the sunshine of one of my favourite places while being cheered on by supporters, and I loved the whole experience. The only odd thing was that the COVID restrictions meant that we had to be given our medal before we started, so it weighed heavy in my race vest. But by God, when I hurled myself across that finish line, I pulled it out and proudly wore it around my neck, all the way back to the moho. For all the joy I had here, though, my year of racing would soon start to unravel, and a fall off my paddleboard at Loch Lomond a couple of weeks after the frost by five killed any hopes of my starting the Great Glen Ultra, despite my best efforts to make it to the start line. I was deeply saddened that I was too sore to even start the race, and as runners were setting off, I was lying in the moho, less than a mile away from the start line, trying to get to sleep, annoyed at wasting another opportunity. I was even more annoyed when we were parked up the next night in Inverness, less than 300 metres from the finish, and I watched it jealously as competitors completed the course. I couldn't bring myself to go and support the runners, as I was simply too miserable, and on reflection, I realised that that was me being selfish. But I'm good at being selfish sometimes, and this was one of those times. However, the paddleboard injuries cleared up, and racing continued throughout the summer, with an awesome beach race in St Andrews, where I enjoyed the delights of facing a giant fabric lobster in the coastal waves. The Splash and Dash also introduced me to the wonderful Yvonne, who would get in touch post-race and be a wonderful addition to the circle of awesome runners I know. I followed the Splash and Dash on the next day, with a jaunt down to the Solway coast to take part in the marathon there. From getting home from one race, to leaving for the next race, was actually only about five hours. And so I remember arriving at the event, after a near four hour drive, feeling both exhausted and uninterested in running. I mean, 
I don't like road marathons. They're as boring as shit to me. And I did consider just turning the car around and heading home. However, I got a bit of a second wind and met some of the local runners and also a few of the crowd who hang out with Rachel and Travis from the Saxons, Normans and Vikings events. And I realised that I might be about to have a really fun day. Even as I trundled along the course, taking in some lovely views across the northern English coast and most southerly of Scottish coastlines, I found something I had not experienced in a very long time. A road marathon I could enjoy. This is one of the happiest races I would take part in over the course of 2021, and I would happily go back to the Solway Coast Marathon time and time again. I mean, I'd probably be keen to wear some road shoes next time. But other than that, it was brilliant. This was such a small and perfectly formed event that I can't heap enough praise on it. And it had a cracker of a medal too. Perhaps most importantly, I came away from this race with a tremendous amount of self-belief. And that would be crucial going into the following week where I would face four events over four days at the now infamous tour of Tameside. I've written about the tour of Tameside and spoken about it extensively in the season one finale of the podcast. I disliked it. To me, it was the overboiled and unflavoured Brussels sprouts of racing. I think the thing is, when you travel a long way to do events, you hope that they are good, or at the very least offer you something interesting. And the tour of Tameside offered none of this. I found the tour of lame side as i refer to it as boring tedious and energy sapping and over the four events my love of running was mercilessly murdered after this series of events i simply stopped running and to be fair have struggled ever since i can't find any consistency and it didn't help that one of these four events was the proper kickoff of my hip flexor injury that has done so much damage to my running But it wasn't just that, it was the Covid security of the event, which really wasn't up to scratch. Plus the crappy medals and the dullest dishwater routes, and so many other things. The highlight of this event was leaving Tameside, a sad indication of how little I enjoyed it. However, there was one thing about it that was worthwhile, and that was I finally got to meet the lovely Nikki and Rob, who both make my highlights of 2021. Meeting them, especially Nikki, provided some significant solace against my anguish over attending the tour of Tameside. The injury that I picked up, though, did mean I was a non-starter at the John Lucas Memorial, and that was another kick in the gonads. I also happened to be a non-starter of the Speyside Way Ultra because of a logistical parenting issue. Although the injuries were still there in the background, But by that point, I was trying to massage them across start lines and, more importantly, finish lines. The Speyside Way DNS was different because the Ginger Ninja was called into surgery late to try and save an animal's life. And by the time she got home, it was too late for me to make it to the start line as I hadn't been able to leave the house because I was on parenting duty. It was a case of, oh well, can't be helped. And I wasn't as pissed off about it as I thought I would be. Perhaps because I knew secretly my body needed more time to recover. That said, getting to the start line of the Speyside Way remains high on my events list, and I'll certainly be looking to start in either 2022 or 2023. The problem really was that my succession of niggles, issues and complications led to a downward mental spiral that I'm still addressing. But when you combine it with the physical injury stresses, then it should come as no surprise that my end of 2021 was a lot less positive than the start. But as September rolled around and with three shiny new did not start under my belt, I felt that maybe I might be about to turn a corner. I knew that if I completed the Cheviot Goat and all the Ranger Ultras series, I would still surpass my goal of 60 ultramarathons since March 2013. So it wasn't all doom and gloom, and when I most needed to find some joy in running, I had a truly amazing time at the Great Perthshire Tatty Run. 
It seems that when you're feeling down, those closest to you ride in upon a glittery unicorn and rescue you. The Ginger Ninja, ASK and I were all competing in different races at the Perthshire Tatty Run, carrying large loads of potatoes, and it was such a joyous thing, I can't quite describe it. It's one of those things, that when you run such a short distance, you get a massive buzz, because it's over before it started pretty much. And to an ultra runner, you can just soak it all in. It is a zero pressure race. The tatty run at just one mile makes you realise how much fun running can actually be, even when you've got 20 kilos of spuds on your back. As we left Perth, hauling our swag of 32 and a half kilos of spuds and a trio of medals, I remember the faces of my two fellow runners, and that will be the gift that keeps on giving. But not all races can be just one mile, and so there was the return to the ultramarathon distance in September, and although my hip flexor remained a constant issue, I had decided to run. The event was part of a Grand Slam series of races from Ranger Ultras that I should have run in 2020, but the old C word put the kibosh on that, and so instead I took part in the 2021 edition, starting with the Pennine Bridleway 55. The trouble was that the Grand Slam was taking part over a seven-week rather than seven-month period because it had been condensed together after the April edition of the Pennine Bridleway was delayed due to the restrictions at the time. I concluded that I didn't want to wait another year to try my hand at these events and so found myself working towards the start line of the PB55. Now had I realised that the Peak District is about six hours away from where I live, and that my partner's working schedule meant that I couldn't leave home until she arrived back at about 9pm the night before the race. I might have thought somewhat differently about doing these. However, I loaded the car with litres of coffee, chocolate and milkshake, and rolled up to a very small, perfectly formed event. And although the hard-packed nature of the trail would be an absolute shit for my body, I did indeed enjoy myself very much. I met so many wonderful people. I ran alongside some truly exceptional athletes and I found in the organisers a team I would really, really like. What I will admit is I really didn't enjoy the afterwards of searching for diesel during the middle of a fuel crisis, nor did I enjoy the English approach to Covid that I was witnessing, because by the summer of 2021 people seemed to have forgotten or were choosing to ignore the pandemic. However, despite my reservations about returning to England, I looked forward to testing myself on what looked like to be the highlight of the Grand Slam, the Yorkshire Three Peaks Ultra. The Yorkshire Three Peaks Ultra was both a little bit closer to me in terms of travel, albeit with the same logistical issues, but I turned up to a truly brilliant event, even better than the PB55, it was bigger and therefore more atmosphere and it had a real buzz about it that I got right into the groove of. I've already written and said all I need to say about how great Ranger Ultras are. Some might accuse me of licking the hole, but actually they just know how to organise a damn fine event and as the Yorkshire Three Peaks brutalised the fuck out of me, I realised just how much Stu Westfield and the team understood ultra running. I delighted in the up, and I delighted in the down of this race. I mean, it is true to say that the injuries that have been furthered during the Pennine Bridleway really, really fucked me over here, but that didn't stop me from finishing the 70k version of this event with a smile. Well, at least inside I was smiling. Outwardly, I was furious. I'd failed to complete the 100km version of the event and therefore my Grand Slam was over. Something that I was really hoping to achieve. But it just wasn't to be. And as I drifted in and out of consciousness during my drive home along the M74, I chastised myself regularly for that failure. Not making the Grand Slam, primarily because of the injuries I had sustained in the earlier part of the year, 
drew into question whether I would bother turning up for the final two races at all. There seemed little point, especially with the Chevy at goat a couple of weeks afterwards, and maybe I should just remain home. However, my name was at the top of the points leaderboard, and I felt like this was an opportunity I could grasp on reflection, and after what happened next, I wish I hadn't bothered, but I did. I recall sitting in the kitchen with the Ginger Ninja and saying, I'm top of the Ranger Ultras leaderboard. Well, joint top. The Ginger Ninja looked at me in a bemused way and replied, But you're a terrible runner. And this was where my vexation came from. I am a terrible runner, and therefore I shouldn't be at the top of any leaderboard, especially just for turning up, a point I made to the race organisers when I next saw them, which was handily, just a few days after this conversation with the Ginger Ninja took place. I'd rolled up for a weekend of running in the peaks amongst people I had come to consider friends and comrades, old and new. But I left feeling deflated and distraught about running. In short, the first day of racing had gone pretty badly. I had a suspected broken foot and my hips were in pieces. Added to this was the ignominy of being DNF'd from the event despite finishing the first day, and this meant I couldn't reach 60 ultras this year, no matter what happened at the Chevy at Goat. I knew that I'd done something serious to my foot, and I should have DNF'd at about mile two, but I didn't because I believed, incorrectly, that a finish on day one would count towards my ultra total, a total that I am ultimately proud of, as it is a testament to my mental attitude in the face of being a piss-poor athlete. But to finish day one of the Peaks North and South weekend and having it not count and therefore be a waste of my effort has left a very sour taste in my mouth and I'm not sure whether I'll be attending any further Ranger Ultras events. Don't get me wrong, it was my mistake and I accept that. I should have checked. I should have checked the rules, I should have checked the route which was mostly very hard-packed and not suited to somebody as injury-prone as I can be. Had Ranger Ultras DNS'd me for day two and allowed me the finish for day one, I'd have been really happy with that. I could have tried to get ready for the GOAT and reach those 60 Ultras, but instead it brought a close to my Grand Slam adventure in the least satisfying of ways. This being said, all of the hundreds of positive points of racing with Ranger Ultras remain true, and I would certainly say they are worthy of your time and effort, especially the Yorkshire Three Peaks. And for the most part, I have nothing but the highest regard and the highest of praise for Stu Westfield and the whole of the Ranger Ultras family. My attendance at day one, though, of the Peaks North and South did create a quandary of whether I would be making the start line of the GOAT because my foot was looking pretty grim. And when I went to hospital, I was advised that a minimum of six to eight weeks without running was in order. Well, of course, what I heard was six to eight days. And so I planned to be on the start line with 10 days of no running and careful planning to get me round. I ordered new kit, lots of it in order to give me an even lighter weight advantage against the various injuries that have plagued me in the second half of the year. I lurked around social media as other people commented on the route, the storm, the bogs, and even whether to take crampons. I had decided I would leave it until the last second to decide if I would go, and then as my bags were packed, my kit was selected, and the car was ready to go, the goat was cancelled. Now the GOAT was never going to be the final event of the year for me, but it would be the final significant one, and it was hugely disappointing not to be testing myself in the cold of Northumberland. However, whatever I was feeling about the GOAT would be inconsequential compared to the distress that would be caused to the organisers and anyone else affected by the ravages of Storm Arwen. I'm fortunate in that I will line up next year at the GOAT, and I will thank the whole team for their efforts, because they really deserve it. I'm hopeful I'll get to see many of them in January, as I've signed up for the winter wipeout from Cold Brew events, and I can't wait to get there, because this will give me a taster of the goat. But before the winter wipeout, 2021 isn't quite over. 
I have a festive 7k to run with the family, and it was to be ASK's biggest race distance to date. And after her outstanding performance at the rather hilly Edinburgh Mo run in November, I was convinced she had what it took to move up to 7 kilometers and beyond. And thankfully, she proved me right as she thundered around Crammond and raced those 7 kilometers, beating her mum significantly. I have no doubt she's almost ready for the 10k. Just don't tell her mum. I'll be in a shitload of trouble. So 2021 hasn't been a waste. But nor has it been a success, and I'm sad about that. But well, we live and learn. So the best of 2021. Despite the shit show, 2021 had several big highlights. There was the general return to racing, but there were also some significant specifics that really made a memorable mark on me. Sean at the White Peaks 50 that I spent time with. He was incredibly memorable and really brilliant. Seeing ASK's face earn a second medal at the Mo Run for being the youngest runner there. Running into the sea at St Andrews to chase down a man dressed as a lobster. And that was perhaps the funniest thing I did. The time spent with Kieran though at the Ultra Scotland 50 was some of the most wonderful hours I've ever done running. I spent most of that time swearing I was in a lot of pain, but it was just general big kids pissing about in the hills, desperate to finish. I suppose that's the thing about the running I do. It's all solo except for when I go racing, and then I get to delight in the people I meet. There's probably a lesson in that statement somewhere. So what went so badly wrong in 2021? I'm usually pretty good at identifying the big issue that caused the ruin of my year, but 2021 was different. I mean, I know the big causes, they were the hip flexor injury and the mental unravelling at the Tour of Thameside, and that's not something that any physiotherapist can help with. The real shit is that I did lots of the right things for a change. My weight dropped, I did training, I did cross training, I did stretching, I went for regular physiotherapy. I returned to writing the blog, I started the podcast. Nothing ever really, but nothing ever really went very well. All the races had twinges, all the efforts felt laboured. And as a new year approaches, I hope to leave that sense of foreboding and wheezing behind me. So what did I learn to take into 2022? Well, I'd like to say that I learned lots from 2021, and that my racing next year will be bold and fun and filled with learning experiences but I'm such an old stick in the mud that I'll probably just repeat the same old mistakes again. I'm always full of good intentions that just never happen. However, I'm going to try and do the things I did well in 2021 again and avoid the things I did badly in 2021 and see if I can make it through a full calendar of events. But what about running in a Covid world? Running in a COVID world was initially very odd, but by the end, I appreciated it. I didn't enjoy racing in England very much because the attitude towards COVID there was different. And I'm grateful for Scotland's tighter restrictions and also the people's desire to follow the rules. What I can say is that I found the COVID protocols wanting at events like the Tour of Tameside where most people didn't seem to give a fuck. And even at some of the other events I attended, I was quite surprised that people were not wearing face coverings. I feel that COVID guidance will significantly influence my 2022 decision-making regarding the races that I run. Now, what was the best event of 2021? Ah, well, that's really tough. At the time of writing... I would say that the highlight event of my year was the Yorkshire Three Peaks. It was a real bastard of a route and a genuine trail, which I 100% loved. I was a little sad not to run the extra 30k, but I'm not sure I missed much, as it would just have been for time on my feet rather than enjoyment. I found enormous joy in the organisation and the team behind Ranger Ultras. 
I would probably also say that the Mo run around Holyrood Park with my family was genuinely brilliant. And to witness my seven year old as the youngest runner on the course not only finish, but finish brilliantly was a real joy. The only bitterness I have is that I know she could have shaved off about eight minutes from her time. But because we decided to run as a family, we needed to stay with the Ginger Ninja. Maybe next year, we'll run a few races without Mum. And then the future. A couple of weeks ago, I'd have said that the future is more of the same. But there were issues at my race that have given me a real kick in the nutsack. And do make me wonder if running is for me. Don't get me wrong. I love running. I love the long distance running and getting lost inside myself. I love the writing and podcasting that comes with it. And I love sharing my adventures. But the costs just keep rising. And I don't mean the financial implications. Although ask me about that after my Ultimate Directions Fast Pack 20 arrives from France and I've got a stinking import duty bill to pay. What I mean is that my body is suffering and suffering increasingly badly and the payoffs are getting less and less. So when I travelled six hours to the Peak District and finished day one of the races and thought I had earned a finish and possibly even a medal but it turned out what I'd earned was fuck all other than a DNF and an exhausting six hour drive home that really doesn't help create enthusiasm for racing. Now take out the fact that I really like the guys who run Ranger Ultras This means that their cheapest chips event was actually incredibly expensive to me and nothing to show for it, except that DNF. Oh, and the visit to the x-ray department to see if I've broken my foot. Oh, and the likelihood that I wouldn't be making it to my next race. Even if I'd had the best day out in all the racing I've ever done, this still probably wouldn't have been worth all the effort and inconvenience. And I'll be honest, It wasn't a bad day out, but it certainly wasn't anywhere near the best. If it had been an isolated incident, then maybe I could just put it down to one of those things. But there is no doubt that the Ultra Scotland 50, for all that it gave me, also left me deflated in the same running sense. So the future of my running has to be to do the things that really, really float my boat. And to that end, I'd originally looked at starting the year with a paddleboard race. But that's been cancelled. So instead I've decided to join the Ginger Ninja for a weekend of running. She'll do the Kielder Night 10k. And then the following morning we'll be off for me to face the cold brew event Winter Wipeout. But now the Ginger Ninja's race has been cancelled. And so it's just me running. Then I'm doing a couple of local looped ultras in January and February. Hopefully followed by a return to Kent for a 900 mile round trip to race 10 epic miles around Viger. I'll finish up the races that have hung over from 2020 such as the Loch Ness 360 and the Bonnie Prince Ultra. As well as Run the Blades, a race I've been trying to do for several years now. And then I'm going to find more of those low key ball busters I love. Maybe the Oak Hills Ultra again, where I was sick as a dog when I attempted it in 2019. And if Covid allows, it's about time I return to the Santa Leon, my favourite ultramarathon and the best race experience I've ever had. Perhaps the other thing that I'll be doing in 2022 is finally getting my running group up and moving. It's the thing that I'm most nervous about because it creates a responsibility and a timetable that I might need to adhere to. But that's in the near future. And hopefully should be up and running by the time the first real episode of the second season of the podcast comes round. Keep your fingers crossed for me. But if I only learn one lesson this year, and it's that I really need to run the stuff I want to run, rather than the stuff that fits. And so, thanks for listening. This may not have been very interesting, but there might have been some things in my own musings that you are considering yourself especially about how to deal with things going wrong. And if any of you lovely listeners wish to get in touch with me, you can do so at ultraboycreates at gmail.com and I'm always happy to chat through running or adventures. Running can be lonely and if the pandemic has taught us anything, it is that we need to grasp opportunity and be more open to those opportunities. So that's the end of 2021. 
More episodes of the podcast will be coming in the new year, where I will be looking at things like wild camping with a child, my top five ultra marathons, kit reviews including OM running packs and Topo Athletic shoes, as well as interviews with runners who are a bit like myself, just trying to get along. In the meantime, enjoy your running. See you next time. Oh, and ho fucking hell. This episode was produced by Ultraboy Creates. Music was by Peter Gresser and Annie's Planet. 